Welcome back to the news today. This is the daily debate. Negotiations on the permanent ceasefire deal between Israel and Hamas will begin in Cairo on Tuesday. But in the meantime, it seems that the obstacles are getting larger. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas told Hamas that the unity government should get full control of the Gaza Strip. Reports say they, this uh, claim got the backing of Egypt, who told Hamas that the Rafah crossing will not be open until the unity government is in charge of the strip. So today we will ask, how will this affect the ceasefire talks with Israel? And with me tonight is Avi Melamed, intelligence analyst and fellow at the Eisenhower Institute. Good evening. Good evening, Lucy. Good to have you back. And also Avi Pelzner, former Israeli ambassador to Italy and France. Good, Good evening, evening, Lucy. Good to have Good you evening. again. So uh, before, gentlemen, we will start talking if it will affect, if it affects, if it will do anything, here. First, let's uh, go to Nureed to see uh, what our viewers had to say about uh, that. Nureed, good evening. Good evening, Lucy. So as you just mentioned, we have a lot of crucial talks happening at the same time this week that are, of course, very interconnected, Fatah and Hamas and Israeli and Palestinian talks. So we asked our viewers about that connection. We asked them, would a Fatah Hamas reconciliation, if it happens, of course, help peace with Israel? Our poll uh, was quite pessimistic. 84% said no, it will not help peace. Only 14% said yes. So let's take a look at our viewers. A lot of them pointed to Hamas, something we hear a lot, of course, from Benjamin Netanyahu, that Hamas is a terror organization and not interested in peace. That's the bottom line. So David said, no, it doesn't help before it. It only hindered it. Besides, Hamas is a terror organization that has Israel and every Jew's death in their charter. So he points, of course, to the terror. Meg said, no, Hamas will start launching rockets again at Israel and does not want peace. Eve and uh, Carmen took it, on the other hand, to another argument we hear a lot from the Israeli government about recognition of Israel. He said, peace will only come when the entire Arab world has accepted, accepted and recognized our legitimacy to live on our land, and when the Arab world will stop feeding groups who seek our destruction, uh, namely Hamas, I assume he's referring to. Carmen also said uh, it's, about, it's up to Hamas to recognize Israel, otherwise no peace is possible. Others took it to a slightly different direction. Evelyn said Fatah and Hamas are the same thing, in fact. She said their method to accomplish the same goal is different. One of them chose terrorism, Hamas, and Fatah, a more subtle uh, political method. And she said, in any case, they don't succeed in working together. And let's just end with Jodel, who took it to the Israeli side, which, of course, is very important. Israel is a very big part, is one half of these peace negotiations. He says it gives nothing. The points of disagreement in peace negotiations have nothing to do with Hamas and Fatah. He says the failure is due to a lack of seriousness of Israel. And of course, Lucy, you've mentioned a lot on the news today that the Israeli government found an excuse either way, when there was a unity, when there was a unity government, when there was not. So this is, of course, the big point. And I'm sure Avi Malamed is there smiling and has a lot of analysis to give us. So I'll send it back to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anurit. Smiling indeed. <laughs> yes. So do you think that this will affect anyhow, somehow? Israel point of view on the things because we know that this is not a real unity government this is a not a real the real deal but can it really Israel will understand this and how Hamas will accept this because Hamas understands right now that they are in a really big problem and no one wants to give them anything not keys not governing nothing so what are they planning to do Hamas yes I don't know <laughs> I mean, look, um, the, the currently the most important talks in Cairo are not between Hamas, the indirect talks between Hamas and Israel, it's between Hamas and Fatah. This is the big story that's really going on over there. And this is the most important thing with the potentially uh, more uh, <coughs> substantial ramifications. I think as far as the Israeli government is concerned, the Israeli government, uh, for different reasons, politically and so on, is mostly looking in the external circles. That's the reason Netanyahu is constantly talking about the opening of New Horizon, he basically alluding or hinting to the Saudis and the Egyptians and so forth. By the way, basically that is correct. I'm always saying, and I will keep saying it all the time, in the end of the day, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, discourse is going to be subject to things that are going to happen in the external circles. Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the whole things that happens today in the region, ISIS, these merging coalitions and so forth and so forth, they are all impacting this inner small circle called the Israeli-Palestinian. In the end of the day, we have to remind ourselves that in the big picture of the Middle East, 
really Israel and the Palestinians are a very small uh, circle. And by the way, that is one of the reasons, I think, one of the reasons that will um, convince Hamas not to resume the fire after this after ceasefire. The ceasefire. I think the whole question is whether we have been able or not to deter Hamas. If we have not been able to deter Hamas in this last war operation, as you want to call it, then nothing will help if we go to Cairo, if there are talks, if there are no talks. But if we have been able to deter Hamas, and it is possible that we might know it only in the future, like, for example, Hezbollah in Lebanon, that we know it eight years after. But if we have been able to deter Hamas, then I think Israel should look at this Cairo talk as an opportunity, okay? As an opportunity to reach a modus vivendi with Hamas, not forever, not a peace agreement, not even an agreement. A kind of situation for five years, for 10 years, where we can build a kind of relationship where there is no more shooting, no more missile, and no more so iron maybe dome. Maybe it's a golden opportunity to Israel to basically realize what it promised in Operation Protective Edge. It went out, Benjamin Netanyahu uh, went out to the public and said, we are going to demolish, to destroy, to isolate, to, 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 to Hamas. At the end of the day, it didn't happen, but it did. It's starting to happen. Hamas is crushed. Hamas is isolated. Hamas in a really, really big mess right now. And maybe this is the opportunity, the golden opportunity that Israel exactly. seeks this is what right I say. now. This is what they say. Maybe they are in a situation where they can accept reasonable terms to live side. I don't want to say side by side. That's an irony to say side. They live there. We live here. We don't fight each other. They get the minimum they need for their population. They get the minimum they need for their stand. And Israel can really start maybe a negotiating process with the Palestinian Authority, okay? Which does not necessarily include, for the moment, Gaza. You know, when we're looking at the map and you say maybe it's uh, Israel and the Palestinians are a really small card in what is happening right now in the entire Middle East. But uh, Hamas and Fatah, and like you said, the real deal is between Hamas and Fatah and the negotiations happening between Hamas and Fatah. How come Fatah is not seeing the opportunity? How come Fatah is not taking control on the Gaza Strip or doing a coup in the Gaza Strip and saying to Hamas, okay, that's it. You did what you did in 2007. It's about time that we will revenge. Because it's not only the Hamas and Fatah that are quarreling and fighting. It's only Hamas from within fighting, and Fatah from within is fighting as well. We have to remember, talking about Hamas today, what we see in Hamas, there are rifts, there are cracks. By the way, Musa Abu Marzouk is the, is the Hamas partner in the negotiations right now in Cairo, which is very interesting, because it's the same Musa Abu Marzouk that only recently in an open interview says, well, there is no reason why can't there be a negotiations with Israel. While Khalid Mashal immediately said, like, no, 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 that's out of the question. So you could see that Hamas is not homogeneous. The same applies for Fatah. We have to remember Abu, um, Abu Mazen, in the end of the day, he, is, he belongs to the old regime. He is in a transitional phase. We have to look what we're going on in, in Fatah, the next generation. There are a couple of names that we know from the past, like Dahlan, like Jibril Rajoub, by the way, that some people say that he's in a waiting position, waiting for the right time. We have to remember uh, there are other people in line in Fatah. So basically, when we are talking about Fatah today, we are far from talking about something that is homogeneous, very decisive, very clear, well, very just solid. Just recently, we heard uh, Mohammed Barghouti uh, saying and giving some uh, uh, advices to the Palestinians from jail. Yes, that is correct. So we have to remember that. Talking about Fatah, we have to remember, it is now in a transitional phase. And by the way, the most important, it's, it's an ongoing process that started like 30 years ago already, where the people from inside, as we used to be known, you know, not probably the outside, but people from the inside, meaning the West, mostly the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, uh, are the people that in the end of the day are taking charge. And it will be very enormously important to see what will be the next line of leaders emerging in the Fatah after Abu Mazen time. Will Israel lose the opportunity to lose the opportunity like we love to say about the Palestinians? 
I hope not. You know, you mentioned before that uh, during the war, Netanyahu spoke a lot, or you mentioned, Avi, that Netanyahu spoke a lot about uh, opening to the Arab world, the Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, I can only see one thing, that as soon as the war was over, we were dealing with our own problems. We were dealing with Gidon Saar, and we were dealing with the budget, and we are well, now dealing. Uh, yeah, with yeah, the yeah we have we have our problem. And where is the big uh, the big picture? Where is the big picture of a negotiation with the Arab world or with the Palestinian? I still hope. I still hope that we are now in a good position. Okay, the Hamas is weakened. Uh, Egypt has proven that we can talk business with Saudi Arabia is sending us messages like that. Other Jordan, other country. I think Israel should seize now the opportunity. This you is know, my it belief. Seems, but it seems that uh, Israel is not, um, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu talk about new horizon uh, in the Middle East, opening new horizon. Mm -hmm. It seems that Benjamin Netanyahu doesn't have any horizon on the, the, no, the he's, negotiation he's, he's, at all. Do see? No, he's no, he, really. I mean, I am not here defending. Uh, I am not a spokesman for Netanyahu. Iran. Even, even he when he spoke about the new strategies, yeah. he meant Iran. He didn't mean about he, the peace yeah, negotiations. Yeah, and with Iran, Israel there is now a very dangerous process going on with Iran because Iran is trying to sell a, a, its a nuclear. Pro, a, keeping its nuclear program against helping the West in its war against Daesh, okay? So this is, for Israel, I think, really more important, first of all, to prevent this Iranian move to try to say, okay, uh, you do something for me, I do something for you, okay? This is very dangerous for Israel. Look, I think that uh, Netanyahu does have a, a great opportunity. More than that, Netanyahu always says, for example, in the context of uh, whatever the entity, the Palestinian entity, will be in the West Bank, Netanyahu says Israel's defensible borders are non-negotiable. For example, he says all the time, Israel should be the one that only Israel secured the Jordan Valley. The West Bank should be demilitarized and so forth and so forth. Today, after what happened in the Gaza Strip and after what happened with ISIS and all the things that happened in the Middle East, the international community is much more tuned to such, me such messages and will be much more willing to be receptive to such message. So I think that's a great opportunity for Netanyahu to move forward and to try really to try and to at least to do some kind of like a serious initiative about it. Whether he wants to do that, can he do that, this is a different question. But objectively speaking, I think it is a good opportunity, and I agree with Avi. It's not about hugging and kissing Hamas. Hamas will never, ever recognize the state of Israel. But as I always say, mostly in this studio and with you, Hamas is a radical terror group, very dangerous, very brutal, but, but he's not lunatic. He is not lunatic. He, is no, he knows how to dialogue with reality. Like his mothership. And they have the, political the aspirations. Let's not forget about that. And they want to be recognized in the international community. And maybe this is the time to, you know, there is a turning point. I don't know who will think there. But, but you know, this is a turning point also for Hamas. But do you really see the situation where, let's try to imagine that uh, Fatah is controlling uh, the Gaza Strip. This will, this will not happen as long as Hamas is in power there, Fatah will not control the Gaza Strip. I think, Lucy, we can forget about that. I do not see, maybe you disagree, but I do not see Hamas handing over the keys to to the to, 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 to Fatah like we me, did to Hamas. Let me like say, we did to Hamas. Let me which say was something a big mistake. Naive. Let me yeah? say something that I'm really just out of the blue because Israel won't allow it because Israel it suits Israel that Hamas no. is right now controlling the Gaza Strip no I don't think so I, I don't agree I with you I, I, I can't agree rule with it you. out no I can't rule it out <laughs> <laughs> I don't agree with that I don't agree with that I don't I think that if we had the opportunity really to have the Fatah PLO or Palestinian Authority control the Gaza Strip, it would be much better for Israel. Or it will As be a big problem for Israel because then it will have really to reach an agreement with the Palestinian. It will have to understand how it's connecting these two people, one in the West Bank, one in the Gaza Strip, and it needs to find a solution for we them. We will build a tunnel.
We laat Hamas to build the big tunnel. Who can control, uh, take control of the Gaza Strip? Look, first, like Avi said, and I agree with him, Hamas will not, is not going to handle over the key. But on the other hand, what we'll probably see is some kind of returning of the Palestinian Authority to the Gaza Strip for a very practical reasons. And the process has just begun, because we have to remember something enormously important. In the end of the day, even the Palestinians themselves know that if they will come to the table and they say, like, OK, you know what, let's negotiate with Israel. The first thing Israel will come and say, OK, mm -hmm. what are you going to do with Azadin and Qassam Brigade? 25,000 armed people, are they going to be disarmed? Are going to be because the I'm Palestinian going... president himself said so? Yeah, I'm going to take uh, tunnels. You know, tunnels. Yeah, tunnels. Good, idea. good ideas. <laughs> good ideas. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Of course, we will continue thank talking you. about the Palestinians and the Israelis for a long time, but we are going to take a break. Two minutes, then we'll be back.